Got a question for you. Who in here prefers to see a movie trailer before you see a movie? Mm, I'd say the minority. All right. Alicia is not a fan of movie trailers. If we're ever going to watch a movie, she's like, it gives away all the good stuff. It tells me too much. I don't want to see the trailer. But for me, if I'm going to spend my $1.75 at Redbox, which by the way, don't you remember when they were like 35 cents? Come on, Redbox. I've got five kids. Maybe I'm making that up. But now $1.75, if I'm going to spend that, I want to see the trailer. I want to see, okay, is this going to be worth my buck seventy-five? And I'm hoping that it will draw me in. I'm looking for something that's going to make me think, all right, I need, this is worth my money. This is worth my two hours. That's what a trailer is meant to do. It's meant to be a teaser. It's meant to draw you in. It's meant to show you all the best moments of the film. It's meant to show you the funniest scenes of the film. It's to show you the sweetest special effects of the film. And you always know, especially if you go to the movies, how effective a trailer is by what people do. So if there's this trailer and you see people lean in, man, that, that looks good. We need to see that. Well, you know, trailer did its job. We don't go to the movies often, but when we do, 90% of the trailers we watch, Alicia says three words. <laughs> that looks terrible. <laughs> it's a failure of a trailer. Now, movie trailers are actually a really good metaphor for the church, as we've been seeing in 1 Peter chapter 2, the chosen race, the royal priesthood, the holy nation. We, as the community of the new covenant, are to be a trailer of the coming new world, a preview of the kingdom of Christ, a teaser for the age to come. We show the watching world what redeemed humanity is to look like and to function like. And according to Peter, if we're faithfully following the Lord, people will look at us and they'll say, I want to know more. What is going on with this group of people? What is it they have? What makes them so excited about life? What makes them able to endure trials? What makes them so selfless and sacrificial with their time and with their resources? What makes them different? As he's going to say in chapter 3, people will ask us about the hope that we have. And so in order to do this, we must engage the world. We can't shrink back and separate ourselves totally like the monks, but we can't compromise either. We, as the cliche goes, it's true, our need to be in the world, but not of it. And our passage this morning is going to help us know how. So we're in 1 Peter 2, verse 11. And today we really get to the heart of the letter. Everything else, the last seven weeks has just been introduction. Peter's a good preacher. Reminds me of the girl who asked her, her dad, daddy, what does the preacher mean when he says, finally? And the daddy says, honey, he means nothing by that word. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. So everything's been intro, and now we come to the heart of the letter of 1 Peter, which is chapter 2, 11 to chapter 4, verse 11. Let's read those together. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. We're just going to cover 2, 11 to 17. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your kindness this morning to call us together to be able to pray your word and sing your word and hear your word. And I pray that we'd be formed by your word. I pray for our college students this morning, many of whom will be going on to finals and other things this summer. I pray that you'd give them favor in their finals. I pray that they would work hard for your glory, but ultimately wouldn't find their identity in grades and letters, but would find their identity in Christ crucified in their place, that they've died with him and have been raised with him. Pray for their summer as they, some will go, some will stay. I pray that this wouldn't be a summer of checking out, but it would be a summer of growth in Christ. Be pleased to form them and all of us as we 
begin to think about our summer plans. May Christ be central. And Lord, this morning as we turn to your word, help us again, we ask, as we do every week. Shape us, form us, convict us, challenge. If there's those here that do not know you, show them the beauty of Christ and the gospel and grant them faith and repentance today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So in these verses, three main calls from Peter. One is to be a contrast society. And really to do that, he gives us two others. Number two is to submit to authority. And then three, live as slaves of God. So number one, be a contrast society. We see that in verses 11 and 12. Look again, 1 Peter 2, 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So we're foreigners here. We've seen that before. We're exiles. He called us foreigners in verse 17. He said, live out your time here as foreigners living in the fear of the Lord. We're strangers to this land. Ultimately, we're sojourners. We're aliens, which is why this series is called Resident Aliens. We are resident here in this world, but really we're not. We're immigrants. We're aliens. Those two words don't seem to go, get, to go together as we saw, right? Like jumbo shrimp or live recording or original copy or freezer burn or honest politicians. That's what we are, though. We are elect exiles, resident aliens here. But at the end of the day, our allegiance is not here. He calls us exiles in verse 1, and he calls us exiles again here. We've been exiled from our true homeland. This is not our ultimate destination. We've been exiles. So that's why he calls us exiles. In some ways, there's lots of ways we could summarize the whole story of the Bible. Lots of ways we can do that because all of its beauty and diversity. But one way is through exile. So think about it. We have creation. All is well in the garden. God, Adam and Eve are with their God. Things are as they're supposed to be. But then you have sin. And they're removed from the presence of God. They're removed from the garden. And then they're guarded from the garden. They're in exile. And we've been in exile ever since. We are east of Eden. So you have creation, sin, exile. And then you have the forming of the people of God, but they sin as well, just like Adam and Eve. And they're kicked out of God's presence and they're exiled, whether it be Babylon or Assyria, Persia or Rome or America. God's people have always been in exile. Creation, sin, exile. The good news is restoration. And as Jesus comes, he begins to end the exile and bring us home. It's a really important but neglected theme. And so I wanted to show you guys a five-minute video about that I think they do a really good job of this theme of exile. These Old Testament prophets are so important. That's why last week we hammered down in Isaiah 43, which is all about God returning to his people and ending the exile, the new exodus or Hosea. So no longer are they a people. Now they will be called my people. What the deal is, is that we are being free through Jesus. The new exodus has come. And so now we, as we wait to the final deliverance, or we'll be in our final home. We are still here. And so he says, we are urged as foreigners and exiles. This world's not our ultimate home. We're citizens of heaven. We're visiting strangers, alien status, transitory existence. So he says, be a contrast society because we're foreigners to this society. We're different. We're different here because this text says we abstain from sinful desires. It's one of the ways we are a contrast society. Instead of pursuing them or easily giving in to them, we abstain from sinful desires. We're different. The passions of the flesh, whatever it is, and it's different probably in different degrees for all of us. What are we tempted? Is it lust? Is it greed, covetousness, the desire to fit in with the world? Is it worry? Is it the fear of man? Is it jealousy? Is it rage? Is it pride? Peter says this, these sinful desires wage war against our soul the word for wage war there is this word that's similar to strategies it's like a military army they have strategies to come and to take us out they have offense they have defense the christian life is war it's not a cruise ship it's a battleship and the battle is right here it's inwardly remember again he doesn't say Stop abstaining from sinful actions. He could have said that, and of course he assumes that, but he goes deeper. He wants not just conformity to external commands. He wants heartfelt obedience. God wants all of us. He wants desires that will please him. We saw this, but in case you were 
gone or in case you've slept since then, look over at chapter 1, verse 14. This idea of getting deeper than merely actions, but to desires, to affections, to our hearts. Verse 14 says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We had these desires and when we come to Christ, we no longer conform to them. Now we abstain from them. It, it's the heart level. And again, just to, just to remind you, flip back just another page to James chapter 4. Verse 1, really important verse for us to know if we're going to walk faithfully with the Lord. What causes fights and quarrels among you? That's the external stuff. We've got to deal with that, but to truly deal with that, we've got to go deeper. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Sinful desires are waging war against us. And so we've got to know that. We've got to know that the problem is first and foremost right here. I have more trouble with Blake White than any man I know. Every problem starts right here. And this is so important, friends. We can't control what's going to happen outside of us. We have no bearing on that. We are not God. But by the grace of God, we can control what happens inside of us. The evil desires here that we are called to abstain from. And so be a contrast society. And one of those ways we're going to do that is we abstain from sinful desires. We do heart work. And then he says, be a contrast society by living good lives, by maintaining a good way of life. Look back at 1 Peter 2.12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're to live good lives. We're to have honorable conduct. And what's interesting here, it's in such a way that even the pagans will recognize, okay, that's a good way of life. That's a good way to live. There is some essence of good that transcends religion because here the, even the pagans will say, okay, that is good. Live lives that can, all people will point to and say, that's honorable. And he says, live good lives among the pagans. Again, we can't think that the, the way of the monk is the way to live. We can't just totally separate and totally disengage. If we're going to live this way, we've got to live among the pagans. First Corinthians five is a, is a really hard chapter. It's uh, at least it's not politically correct and it's not taught on much. It's about church discipline. And in there, he actually tells the church, you are to judge one another. Now, not judge in the sense of like holier than thou, I'm self-righteous, get it together. The idea is that we hold one another accountable. And so if there's a member of Southside and they're straying, other members are responsible to grab them and warn them and say, hey, don't pursue that. Come back to the Lord. And so this is what 1 Corinthians 5 is about. I want to bring it up, though, just to show that we are to be engaged in the world. Let me flip over to 1 Corinthians 5, 9. He's warning them. And he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world because they're everywhere, right? Verse 11, but now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slander, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Well, I think the churches in America would be a lot better shape if we would stop judging those outside this church and start judging our own people and our own members who are not following the Lord faithfully. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church, he says? God will judge those. You expel the wicked person from among you. All too often, the church has just looked over sin. The point, though, here is, look, he says, we've got to be in the world. I'm not saying don't associate with worldly people because then you'd have to get out of the world. And so we're to be in the world here. And Peter says, live such good lives among them so that they can see your lifestyle. Displaying the glory of the Lord, showing the world the good life, a teaser for the coming kingdom, witnessing to the rule of God in our lives and not disengaging. And they'll see and they'll even agree that it's good. 
We haven't had a lot of time to, to go back. This is funny. You'll probably laugh at me saying this. We haven't had a lot of time to go back to the Old Testament foundations of Peter, actually, because you can't say something in every sermon, even though we spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. But a lot of people think that Peter is actually a midrash or a commentary on the book of Jeremiah. And I think, I think Peter is thinking of Jeremiah 29 here a little bit. Let me read these verses to you. Again, it's a letter to the exiles in Jeremiah. Just like 1 Peter is a letter to the exiles. And here's what he says in verse 4. To his people in Babylon, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers you, you too will prosper. Seek the welfare of the city. You go on to read, you know what's going to happen to Babylon? God's going to destroy it. But while you're there, exiles, live honorable lives. Seek the welfare of the city. Look back at 1 Peter 2, 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, there's a big emphasis in Peter on doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live in such a way they have nothing to say. Put them to silence. Live such good lives that even though they accuse you, They'll be put to silence, which, by the way, they will accuse us. Increasingly in America, as Bible-believing Christians, we will be accused. We will be persecuted. And one of the things, two things we're going to have to get comfortable with as Christians in America, number one, not being liked and telling the truth. And those will go together. But the second thing is that we just have to get used to being mistreated increasingly. We're just going to have to get used to being accused in this culture because we can try as hard as we can to be gracious and humble with charity and clarity to speak what God's word says to certain hot button issues and you will still be misunderstood and mistreated and we've just got to be okay with that. Do our part to be clear and charitable but at the end of the day we will be misunderstood and that's okay. He says live such good lives that even though they accuse you they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. He's quoting Sermon on the Mount, isn't he? Let your light shine before others that they may see God and glorify him. So we display what it means to be the Lord's people. We show the world what it means to live under the rule of King Jesus. Remember last week we saw what do we do? We declare. We proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into, into light. What about this week? We display. This is the twofold calling Peter would have us do. We declare and we display what the good life is. Our good life should lead others to glorify God. In this sense, we're all worship leaders. Our lives should lead others to the praise and worship of God. Look again at verse 12. I just want you to see it in the text. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're to live lives that are attractive. It's a preview of the kingdom. It's a trailer of the age to come. And I wonder, is this true of you? Are our lives contrast? Are they distinctive? It's a big deal for Peter. He says it again in, in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, speaking to wives married to unbelievers. Notice what he says. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Isn't that fascinating? Or look in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Is this, is this ever happening? I confess it doesn't happen to me nearly enough. Like something's different about you. Would you tell me what? Is your conduct good? Is it distinctive? Is it 
salty. I said last week that if our lives don't look any different from our neighbors who do not follow Jesus, we probably ought to ask, are we following Jesus? And so we should have a good reputation with outsiders. Again, they're not going to like the truth that we talk about, but our behavior should be a display of the gospel and give credible evidence that the gospel is true. It says something similar over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, we should make it our ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. See, some people he quit working. Verse 12, he says, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent upon anybody. We're to be a contrast society and we're to walk in wisdom, Colossians says, towards outsiders. And so are our lives giving a preview of heaven or the opposite? We're to live contrast lives. That's the first call Peter gives. The second call is to submit to authority. Probably not what we would have thought a good life consisted of. Look at verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Be a contrast society by living good lives. And part of what it means to live a good life is to submit. Submission is part of the good life. It's a big deal. We're going to see it again in verse 18. We just saw it in chapter 3, verse 1. But in our day, submission is a four-letter word, isn't it? Our culture has an authority problem. I think all cultures probably have, but I think ours is maybe at a high point. And we know this because of the messages that the culture preaches. You know, every, every culture has preachers and every culture has evangelists. Every single human being on the earth is being discipled by something or someone. And so who are the preachers and evangelists in our day of the anti-authority culture? Well, it's mostly media. It's mostly advertisements. They're preaching to you and they're discipling you. They want you to believe a certain way and they want to form you in certain ways to buy a false vision of the good life. And I think we see around 10,000 a day. I read somewhere that we see 16,000 advertisements a day wanting to disciple us. And here's some of them. David Wells, theologian, he's put together some of these evangelists of our world. Uh, Nike, everybody knows it, right? Just do it. Forget others, forget authority, just do it. What about Burger King? It used to be have it your way, but they actually changed it recently to be your way. So we're moving far beyond burgers and fries here. Be your way. According to the press release from Burger King, here's what they said. This new tagline reminds people that no matter who they are, they can order how they want to in Burger King restaurants and that they can and should live how they want anytime. Be your way. Don't let anyone tell you anything. You should live however you want anytime. What about Bacardi rum? Some people embrace the night because the rules of the day do not apply. Easy spirit shoes. They conform to your foot so you don't have to conform to anything. Even Merrill Lynch, your world should know no boundaries. Shirk the authority. Neiman Marcus, no rules here. <laughs> to say that we should submit, submit to authority is blasphemy of the secular spirit. Sounds a lot like Genesis 3, doesn't it? Did God really say? Does God really know? He doesn't know good and evil. You ought to be the ones that determine what is right and what is wrong. No rules here. Be your way. And friends, there's really no soft way to put this, that if you have a problem with submitting to authority and God-given authorities, you've got a problem with God. He hasn't left us any other option. Here's the beauty, though, as we'll see. It's actually the path to freedom. Because he knows best and he wants our best, which is submitting to him. And he begins here by commanding us to submit to government. Submit to government. Look again at verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake. This is about him to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors. Now, there are exceptions. 
Anytime the government is asking us to violate the commands of Christ, we say no, just like Peter himself said in the book of Acts. Hey, tell me what's better, Acts chapter 4, to listen to you or listen to him. We can't help speak but what we've seen and heard. Or in the next chapter, chapter 5, verse 29, we will obey God rather than man. And so there are exceptions. But when the government's not asking us to disobey the Lord, we are to submit, Peter says. And government is imperfect, it is messy, it is often full of wickedness, but any government is better than no government. And it's a gift to all people. It's a gift of God's common grace. Romans 13 has a, is a really helpful section of scripture along with this and on the purpose of God in government. Let me read Romans 13, 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you'll be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Augustine said that government is a necessary evil, but it is necessary because of evil. The function of government is to restrain evil. It's to maintain and uphold and protect the sanctity of life and property. And so we're to submit to it. God maintains order in the world for the common good through his appointed governing authorities. So the answer is not no government. We've seen no government. You have no government, it gets bloody real fast, doesn't it? Take away the laws, take away the police, take away the jails, it turns Quentin Tarantino real fast. Just think about the book of Judges. No king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And if you've read the book of Judges lately, you'll know that hardly anything they did was right. And so any government's better than no government. And Peter says to submit to the governor. He said, cease striving for power. I think one of the applications for us in 2018 is to stop the Facebook ranting. Stop the grumbling about political parties. You know it's completely ineffective. It is like boxing the air, training a cat. It's as pointless as a pew pencil. What if it's not helping anything? In fact, it's harming because at the end of the day, you're dishonoring God and you're embarrassing Christians who take passages like this seriously. So what if this? What if every urge you had to have some political rant instead, you just prayed for them as you're commanded to do in the Bible? What if instead of ranting, we just prayed for whoever it is that ticked us off and for our own hearts? Some of you thought the world was crumbling when President Obama was in office. Some of you think the world is crumbling because President Trump is in office. But let me tell you something. They both seem like Billy Graham compared to the person who was in office was Peter's writing this. Let me give you a hint who that was that he says, submit. It's the person that later put Peter to death. It's a guy who kicked his wife to death and everybody knew it. It's a guy who five years into his reign had his mother killed, not his mother-in-law, his mama killed five years into his reign. His name's Nero. And he was brutal. And now 1 Peter was written before the, the widespread state-sponsored persecution, but he was still a very, very wicked man, even at the writing of 1 Peter. And so the point here is that God puts us under authority even when we don't see eye to eye. But we need to submit where we can and just trust the Lord. He's got it. He's got this. Let's trust him. I love Proverbs 21.1 around election time because it says, the heart of the king is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. And he guides it wherever he wills. He's got this thing. But he says more than just submitting to government authorities, doesn't he? Look again. He says, to every human authority. And this is hard. 
But God has put authorities in place. And so Christians, one of the things that makes us distinctive is we submit even when we don't see eye to eye. And so maybe you have just a jerk of a boss. Maybe he's unjust. Where you can, where you're not violating your conscience, submit to him. If you get asked your opinion in a calm way, you can do that. But you submit. Maybe you've got an HOA that's just a Nazi. You submit. You bought the house there. And so you submit to the authorities that are placed over you. Every human authority. And so as believers in this world, we're to value this world and its leaders and appreciate them. And we're to respect our host land, yet still maintaining in a a distinct identity within it, a contrast society by submitting to authority. The third thing is we're a contrast society by living as slaves of God. Look at verse 16. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Isn't that interesting? He says... Live as slaves of God, and he says, live as free people. How does that work? Live as slaves to God, live as free people. Only in the Christian worldview does that make any sense. Because devoted service, what he means by slavery here, devoted service to the Lord our master is where true freedom is found in this life. Lord, bind our hearts that we may truly be free. Freedom is not found in escape from devoted service, but a change of masters. Calvin said that the Christian life is a free servitude. It's a serving freedom. This is the Lord who liberates, but he is a Lord. It's a liberating bondage. It's a bonded freedom. True freedom is found in devoted service to the Lord and to his people. I love the wordplay we have in 1 Corinthians 9 of the Apostle Paul. He's free, but notice how he's going to use his freedom in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself, I'm not under the law in the new covenant, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, the Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. Although I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Though I'm free... I will enslave myself to anyone I have to if it will mean hearing the gospel on their parts. So we're free, but we're called to be devoted servants. Luther said that a a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to none. To all, this is the way we use our freedom as Christians. I love in Galatians 5, he says something real similar to Peter. Hey, you're free, but don't use your free for wrong agenda. In Galatians 5, 13, it's all about being free from the law. And he says, you've been called to freedom. Stand firm in your freedom. You've been called to freedom, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And I think it means there for your selfish ambition, your sinful self. Don't use your freedom for the self. Rather, through love, and the word in most New Te- English New Testament says, serve one another, and that's fine. But it actually says, become slaves of one another. Again, you're free. Don't take advantage of your freedom if it means benefiting you. Rather, in love, become servants of one another. How do Christians use our freedom? For the sake of the Lord and for the sake of one another. We live as devoted servants of the Lord. Freedom is for service. And this is where the good life is found. Giving ourselves to the good of others. That's where true freedom and genuine contentment is found. And then in verse 17, again, he, he says, show proper respect to everyone. All people are to be treated with dignity because all people are made in God's image. Cognitive ability, physical maturation, skin pigmentation, social class, cultural background does not matter in the kingdom of Christ. Which is why Paul says in Galatians 6.15, uncircumcision, whatever that means, doesn't count. And neither does circumcision. 
it doesn't count either. And in other words, anything that you would put your identity in, whether that's race or ethnicity or cultural background, it does not count. What counts is the new creation. And so we show proper respect to all people. There's no partiality. All are to be honored. We don't tear down. We don't slander. We show proper respect. We honor others above ourselves. Then he says in verse 17, love the family of believers. Love them. Give of yourself for the good of your fellow church members. Love is so vital in every book of the Bible. Just look in Peter. We've seen it. We've already seen it. Look back at chapter 1, verse 22. Remember this, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Here's the commandment, love one another deeply from the heart. And we see it in our verse here. And then if you look at chapter 3, verse 8, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another. And then chapter 4, verse 8, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love, giving of self for the good of others is so important. And so he says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Then he says, fear God. Fear the Lord. He said that already in chapter 1, verse 17. He said, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. And not in some slavish fear. We're children of the Father. It's a, a reverential awe. It's a fear of displeasing the Lord, the God who saved us. And then he read, reiterates, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. All people are to receive their proper respect. The family of believers are to be loved. God is to be feared. The emperor to be honored. See, our faith in Christ should affect every area of our life, every relationship we have. And one of the main ways it's restructured is now we put others first. As Jeremiah said to the letter of the exiles, we seek their welfare. It's not about us and building our comfort and our kingdom. And so may the Lord give us grace to be a contrast society, a people who submits to authority, a people that even though free live as slaves of God, may we be an attractive preview, a tantalizing trailer of the kingdom of Christ.